The objective today is to differentiate the speed of computers using Hertz appropriately. So first I'm just going to talk about speed being the real magic in a computer. Then let me give you some unnecessary history, unnecessary science, the measurement of Hertz itself, kind of describe that a bit. And then I'll finish off with an oversimplification so you can walk away feeling a little bit better about this term. However, in terms of computers, Hertz is a very complex thing to think about. Why? Because it all comes down to architecture. But let me hold off on that. I don't want to freak you out right away. Let me just say that the secret of computers is not that they are complex, but rather it is the speed in which they do things. Today, we'll look at exactly how fast their speed is. A little bit of background, Hertz is a unit of frequency, and it is defined as one cycle per second. The thing that's debatable is what constitutes a cycle. It was named after this guy, Henrik Rudolf Hertz. He's uh, living around the uh, late 1800s. He's the first person to provide conclusive proof of the existence of electromagnetic waves. In terms of present day stuff, hertz are commonly expressed in multiples of kilohertz, megahertz, gigahertz, or even terahertz. Now some of the unit's most common uses are in the description of sine waves and musical tones, especially for radio and audio related applications. But it is also used to describe the speeds at which computers and other electronics are driven, so to determine how fast something really is, let's talk a little bit about what a second is. So when I say hertz, I mean the period of time in which nine billion periods of radiation corresponding to the transition between two hyperfine levels of the ground state of the cesium atom. Extra credit if you can explain to me what all of this means, I have no idea. But apparently scientists agree on it, which means we can use hertz to mean one cycle per second. Typically in the world, in these different topics I told you Hertz is used in, in these different topics, we're trying to get them to say it's going to be a complete cycle. During all my research, I did not find somebody using the concept of Hertz to mean something that's only a partial cycle. Now when I show you this computing concept here though, uh, it's going to be really difficult because not every cycle will result in some sort of output that the human is able to see. It could be a piece of an output that ultimately is added to other outputs for the human. But more on that later. Let me just wrap up this slide by saying that 100 hertz would mean basically 100 cycles per second. And this unit can be applied to any periodic event. So for example, a clock might be said to tick at 1 hertz, or even a human heart. You could even say it beats on average 1.2 hertz. You don't have to say 1.2 hertz per second because the second, like I was talking about with the cesium atom, second is an agreed upon concept when we're talking hertz. So Wikipedia is showing us some different frequencies here. So if you really stare at this, that's kind of cool. If I scroll down a little bit, you'll see a wave. So yep, there's a cycle. And in class, when we learn about Wi-Fi, we learn about how these can be turned into ones and zeros. And if you click on sine wave though, you can learn more about it and even play a sound to listen to the concept of 220 hertz. But we are not talking about sound, we are talking about hertz in relation to computers. So most central processing units, they are labeled in terms of their clock rate, which is either expressed in megahertz or gigahertz. This specification refers to the frequency of the CPU's master clock signal. So it was always ironic to me to think about this because the clock is not located inside the CPU. However, a lot of people try to judge CPUs based on the clock. I suppose it's because of the things that are going on in the CPU, they are so important that People wonder about the clock, how the clock is relating to it. And here with this picture, I just thought it was a cool one. First of all, I like seeing where like wires could potentially be inside of computers. But I found this picture from an AVR32 chip website. And these are chips that are fun. They can come on these little modules. They're similar to Raspberry Pis and Arduinos and they're often used for electronics uh, projects. Now, a lot of computers have this crystal oscillator to create the clock for the system. And it's as simple as something like this. Somebody took a little breadboard here and used that AVR chip to make something happen, and we can use these LEDs to see the thing that's happening. For students maybe not so interested in computer science, of course, this thing might not look like a big, big whoop, 
but at the end of the day your computer screen is just a miniaturized version of lights that are on and different colors and they make the pictures that you look at when you're playing your video games. And the cool thing is anyone can build this and look into this. This RISC architecture is now open source. Technically speaking though, it's not a processor, it's a microcontroller, which means it has the RAM built inside of it. This is just a picture of the board that you put the chip on. And in this case with the AVR32, we're talking about a microcontroller chip. So yes, there are different types of chips out there. For my visual learners, here's a quick picture to visualize the difference. Microprocessors will need to go out in order to get memory, to get input, and to get output. For a microcontroller, everything is built inside of one chip, and the input and the output is going directly in and directly out of the chip itself. It says here that unlike microprocessors, microcontrollers possess a CPU along with the RAM, ROM, and other peripherals all on the same chip. So I think microcontrollers is greater than microprocessors. Like most things in this world, it just depends on what you need the computer for to determine what type of microprocessor or microcontroller you'd be using. But we were talking clocks today. I need to focus. The measurement of a clock is Hertz. And I thought I'd show you some YouTube results because these are very helpful. As you can see by the little red lines, I've watched many of them just to make sure I can give you the most simple explanation of what Hertz is. I like this visual as well because basically the clock here is allowing these three things to work together. So in summary, a computer does this type of cycle. It fetches instructions, then decodes those instructions, and then executes the instructions. You see the word instructions in every part of the cycle. So what we're saying is the ability to process instructions is what is being measured by Hertz. The process or the cycle is fetch, decode, and execute. Computer language assembly, which is different and unique for every CPU out there, is nice because it's almost a line-by-line -line representation of this cycle. So you can imagine a person who codes in assembly, if they wrote three billion lines, we're looking at a program that can execute something in a single second. That's like mind blowing. And I'm oversimplifying right now, I shouldn't do that. Let me just finish off this slide by saying, if I had a three gigahertz processor, like most of my students in my class are looking at a computer with a three gigahertz processor right now, if I had that, the clock is allowing the CPU to fetch, decode, and execute 3 billion instructions a second. So I'm going to ask a question here, going out on a limb. I don't mind if you see my own ignorance. What this lesson got me thinking is I wonder if a computer can produce output that outpaces the human eye to see that output. And I was tempted to try to teach this lesson by saying Hertz is the number of outputs you can see or have in a computer. But a better description is just uh, Hertz is the number of instructions that a computer can fetch, decode, and execute. If you're like me, you can learn a lot from watching other people have arguments, so I found a good one right here. The person says, what is the difference between Hertz and frequency? I'm having a debate with some friends. You scroll down right here, there is some really educational things that people say in their answers. I like this uh, third line. It says, think of length versus meter, not even remotely the same thing. I, I mean, I don't agree with that. But what they're saying is, Hertz is like meter and frequency is like length. Hertz is the number of things you use to measure frequency. And then the person's really rude. This is pretty basic. If you're at the point where you're discussing frequency, you should also be able to understand the difference between property and unit, like why the unnecessary insult just help the guy learn, please. I wish this answer was actually upvoted more, but uh, some of these websites, you know, not always going to find the most polite people online, but at least you have a whole world of knowledge at your fingertips. This person says, let's take a sound wave, which cycles from positive pressure to negative pressure and back. That cycle rate is the sound frequency. Ordinarily, you would say that the frequency is 1000 Hertz or 1 kilohertz. However, you could just as well say that frequency is 60,000 cycles per minute or 3.6 million cycles per hour. There's no absolute requirement to express frequency in Hertz, although that is the accepted unit used by virtually all scientists and engineers these days. So in that answer, you also get to see what type of community Hertz is going to be used in. So we're almost done here. Let me just put this in another way, another visual. 
Instructions are fetched from RAM, which we also call main memory, and this is all where instructions and data currently being used are stored. So the CPU fetches that and then needs to decode that. In order to decode, the computer, the CPU, is looking at the binary patterns that make up what's called an opcode. For example, like the summing operation or adding operation, adding two numbers together. And you can find these opcodes in manuals. Then the CPU needs the values it's operating on, and that's when the execution occurs. So I pulled up the Intel manual. If you're interested, you can read all 4,800 pages of this. But to understand the CPU architecture of these types of Intel processors, and to understand the value of those opcodes, you would look at something like this. I wonder how valuable it would be for me to try to read this and post it online just for people who want to kick back and learn by listening to me struggle through the Intel manual. It's pretty amazing we have that 4,000, almost 5,000 page manual to describe just a tiny thing on a computer. That tiny thing. Inside of a very large computer often. And I know I'm showing you an old computer. That's because CPU clock speeds have ranged from 1 megahertz back in these uh, 1970s time. We're talking about such computers as Atari, Commodore, the Apple II is a famous one. And nowadays my students are using a 3.4 gigahertz, specifically an i5V Pro chip. These are the big wide gray screens in my classroom. Good students always want to know the limitations that they can push. At the time of this video, the world's fastest processor is an 8-core Bulldozer FX AMD chip. You can watch a video of this thing in action. It's not a very exciting video, but if you like to nerd out like me, you're going to see a speed of 8.4, and this is actually being done with the help of some liquid nitrogen and helium to cool down the chip before it melts and catches on fire. And let me leave you with this thought, that at the end of the day, it's all about architecture. It's possible for a CPU running at 2 GHz to outperform a 4 GHz processor with a less efficient architecture. And you can go the other way with that too. You could have a 1.8 GHz CPU that is not twice as fast as a 700 MHz CPU. It could be more than twice as fast. Take a multiplication instruction, for example. If a 1.8 GHz CPU can do that multiplication in only four cycles, and the other CPU is using six cycles, well, this is now more than twice as fast as the 900 MHz processor. A good way to visualize this is maybe think about the way you could do six times eight. You could add up eight sixes, and that would take a certain amount of time. Or maybe faster, if you just added up six eights, you could get to the result faster. Think of these two as like a difference in architecture. And now let's think for a moment about some of the world's first computers. According to this website, the ENIAC could execute 5,000 additions, 357 multiplications, and 38 divisions in one second. I thought that was a weird way to phrase this because I wonder if they're saying it can do all of these or just 5,000 additions in a second or 357 multiplications or 38 divisions and then check out how that number decreases significantly. When I went to Wikipedia though I found this paragraph that said the basic machine cycle was 200 microseconds. That's to say 20 cycles of the 100 kilohertz clock in the cycling unit or 5,000 cycles per second for operations on the 10 digit numbers that the ENIAC was working with. In one of these cycles, the ENIAC could write a number to a register, read a number from a register, or add and subtract two numbers. This too is a little confusing, and definitely watch my video on registers to understand the significance of this, because nothing happens on a CPU without first going through a register. So let's finalize the lesson with just my oversimplification. Again, the secret of computers is not that they're complex, but they're very fast. So what happens is the clock triggers an electrical signal, and this signal allows a cycle to occur, okay? It's going to fetch, decode, and execute an instruction. So my example is if I wanted to add one plus one and get two as an output, essentially I could do this three billion times using a three gigahertz computer. The faster the processor is, the faster it can process instructions. So here's your DOL, it's a really easy one. You're just going to 
create a table either on Canvas or Microsoft Word or maybe PowerPoint if you wanted to add some pictures too that'd be great but I need you creating tables in this class so create a table to say the device and then the type of measurement we would likely see associated with that device this may need you to go to Google or rewind the lesson to certain spots so you could get this correct so good luck and don't give up